Welcome in everybody to another edition of our T to Green Extra. PGA Tour is back this week, and we figured we got to give you more thoughts. An hour just wasn't enough on our radio show, which of course airs every Saturday morning from 7 to 8 on WGR. Brian Colziel, Kevin Sylvester, PGA Pro Jeff Metis, and our extra this week. There's, there's a lot to get to, but let's start with golf being back, Kevin. Um, no fans. It's quiet. It's a little eerie, but the biggest names in the world are playing, and I'm excited to have watched some golf already. And hopefully we'll get a good weekend of golf here coming up here as the PGA Tour gets back going. Yeah, it's it's great, right? It's like uh, seeing everybody after summer vacation, right? When you're back to school as a kid. Um, wow, look at Bryson. Boy, dude hit the weights over the summer. Oh, <laughs> Dustin grew a beard. Well, you know, what's the mustache Brooks Kepka's got going on? We saw the bad haircut uh, during quarantine. Wow, Gary Woodland. Whew, looks like he did a lot of running, you know, losing 20, 20. I didn't think Gary needed to lose a lot of weight, by the way, Gary Woodland. He was, uh, he, you know, he's not as big as he looked on television. I can tell you that. So he's very lean right now. So I just thought, you know, that part was cool. Uh, it's Colonial Golf Club. It's a great place. I've been there. I've worked that tournament before. Uh, matter, matter of fact, right behind me, the lower part there, that you see the yellow, that's a Colonial flag down there. It's a special place, Hogan's Alley. Uh, his his office is in the golf shop. It's really cool. There's a trophy room with all of Hogan's trophies. Um, the the, the uh, statue that's there, it's just a great place. It is different not seeing the, the fans there, um, but they're hanging out across the street. <laughs> so they're, they're getting peeks through. Right. Yeah, it's fun to watch golf again and, and see the best players in the world actually competing for something instead of the uh, the fun four ball, you know, that kind of format. I'm just excited to watch these guys play. I'm excited. You know, that break, guys, you know, they worked on certain things and they changed things and they, they probably worked on a weakness in their game. You know, we see DeChambeau got jacked up and um, things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how these guys go through. Um, it is a long season, so that break may not hurt a lot of them. You know what I mean? And if you were struggling in the spring, hey, maybe it's a time to reset. And if you were playing good during the spring, it, it's hard to keep that momentum. But whatever you did, you know, you, you're trying to compete. So um, it, it's great. And now we got a long season of golf. It'll be weird without the, the fans. I still think that. And um, But it's, it's still something to watch. And we have nothing else to watch right now. And golf's one of the best things to watch. So it'll be fun. Kev, are you surprised how many big names were all in here right away? I mean, we've got the entire top five in the world rankings, eight of the top 10. I mean, it's, it's the best field on paper of the season. I know obviously the season was only three months long before it got shut down, but I mean, it's, it's a really, really impressive field. Well, yes, it, it is. I'm not surprised uh, at the strength of the field because of the long layoff and because of what is going to be a sprint now to the FedEx cup playoffs. So players need to get points. Uh, look at Brooks Kepka. I mean, he is way back in FedEx Cup standings. So he needs to play and get some points. Justin Rose does too. So, um, no, it doesn't surprise me whatsoever. They're playing for positioning, uh, that big FedEx Cup prize, Ryder Cup points. Uh, there's so many things at stake. So, no, I'm not surprised. And I think you'll see um, that continue uh, – Hilton Head might be different next week, but you'll definitely see more players um, at River Highlands uh, for the Travelers Championship, and I, and I think moving throughout the summer. You won't see guys taking two to three weeks off. There was uh, the Tiger tracker on his yacht this week that said that it moved, and uh, the thought was that he's going up to Hilton Head to park that yacht. Maybe we'll see him next week. It's, I thought his first tournament would be Memorial in July, but – if there's one place to look when you're curious about sporting things, look at what Vegas thinks. Vegas actually says you can bet on Tiger's return. And the betting favorite is the RBC Heritage next week. So they obviously have maybe a thought because they're not going to lose money on it. So they might they, think well, that Tiger's going to come back next week to play. I, I think, boy, I, I'd be, I, normally Tiger would not play that event. Uh, it, you know, it's usually the week after the masters. Um, but if you want to look at a golf course where, um, iron play and shaping the golf ball is crucial, I, it, he'll, uh, that's even more so than colonial this week. Colonial is a little shorter. 
Um, but Hilton Head, um, you really got to be able to move the golf ball from left to right. Um, and, I, and it's a little tighter than Colonial's. And Colonial's pretty tight. And I think, you know, he's seeing his buds out there. And his, comp, his competitive juice has got to be flowing to some degree. And you're right. He hasn't I, – I can't ever remember watching Tiger play there. Um, so it'll be fun if he does go. Um, and then they, like you said, Vegas isn't making those bets to, uh, to lose money. They, uh, they usually have some kind of uh, information, I would imagine, or, or they know – why would – yeah, that's, a, that's an odd line to find when you can bet on Tiger coming back. But I think it's cool. And I think it would be fun to see him there. It's a different type of golf course for Tiger. It, it, that, would, that would just make it even more fun next week. Yeah. I'm getting excited to get about golf now again. You know, you're starting to watch these players. It makes you want to go out and play yourself. And, and, uh, and just, to, just to watch it is, you know, I, I'm stumbling on my words a little bit here. But it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm glad they're back golfing. Yeah, Memorial, I thought, was going to be the good bet, Brian. But now, um, because of the John Deere being uh, canceled for this year, that Muirfield Village is hosting two tournaments in a row. Uh, Workday is going to sponsor a tournament the week before Memorial. So well, where do you park your boat there? Well, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, that's a. Uh, um, I don't know. Do you park it in Cleveland and drive? Take a two hour and a half hour drive over to Columbus. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't think we're going to see Tiger's yacht coming down the Erie Canal to get to Cleveland anytime soon. So. <laughs> I'll give him away well, as he goes by my house. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he could go all the way up the coast to Hartford uh, in a couple weeks. Um, these are, I have the same problems. Like these boats. Where to cause park your yacht? Problem. I know. Yeah. It's a tough uh, problem. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem with your, your, your extra, extra large Mercedes always like taking up two parking spots. I always yell yeah. you at you at the parking lot. You're taking up two. Yeah. Parking. Where do I keep my horses during the winter? All by, those questions. Yeah. By, by, by the way, you know, uh, yeah, listen, I don't have one of those fancy cars. Um, but if I did, I'd park it normally. Like if you're afraid that someone's going to ding it, don't drive it. Right. Yeah, they always park to be way in the back in the mall. But yeah, yeah but they, then they're, yeah. you know, yeah. they, they angle over two spaces, they creep over. It's like. Yeah, I like to park my car right next to those guys when they park at the back of the mall, just right in the spot next to them. Yeah, you're, you're like a jamming. <laughs> just as close as I can get. Yeah. Yeah, and you climb out the window, do two yeah, hands yeah, now, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, um, this week at Colonial. A lot of obviously exciting storylines, but I want to ask you about one, Jeff, Jimmy Walker. We know uh, the former PGA champion this week went back to hitting a driver with a steel shaft. I don't know if you saw the story or not. Yeah, I did. Yeah. He said that uh, he's been practicing with it. He, you know, pulled it out and said, Hey, you know what? I'm hitting this pretty good. Um, so I don't know if it's a uh, turn back the clock sort of thing, or, or do you think that this will catch on, but um, maybe just maybe explain to everybody, what would be the pros and the cons or even just the, the differences between the drivers of today uh, and him going back to that steel shaft driver that almost no one on the PGA tour plays with at least right now. You know, I think I saw a stat. No one has played a steel shaft since like 2004, 2005 on the PGA tour in their driver. It's something crazy like that. Now a steel shaft is going to be heavier and in part less spin on the ball. And if you think most players, most good players like uh, irons, they're going to have heavier weight shafts in them because they can control the flight of their ball. You know, they're mostly strong enough to create enough speed. He's certainly strong enough to create enough speed. What he's gaining is probably a lower trajectory and less spin by using a steel shaft. Um, and what he's losing is, you know, a lot of the ability. Uh, the shafts now, they, they kick and bend and, and everything else to optimize launch uh, conditions. So it's probably just a comfort thing for him. I got a feeling he must have been struggling with his driver if he went to a steel shaft um, and, and just looking for something that worked. I don't see it being long-term, and I don't see many tour players going to it because you do lose speed. You're using a 120-gram shaft versus a 65-gram shaft. That you're losing some ball or some club head speed, which translates into ball speed, which translates into distance, which, as we can tell right now in the PGA Tour, is one of the, the biggest factors in success right now in that, at that level of golf. Hey, it might be one of those things where he's just going back to, uh, hey, I had great success with this, right? Uh, just a mental thing like, man, I, you know, I, this ball flight reminds me of, uh, you know, what I used to. I got a buddy who still hits a 975J. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> it's like I love the he way I hit the club. Sense. Well, yeah. I, yes, he is technology-wise, but he likes the ball flight and mentally speaking. I'm like, okay, but you're, you're losing 30 yards. 
And the ball is so much different than it was when steel shafts were in drivers. So that's the other thing. You know, the ball driver combination is one of the most studied things in golf, trying to optimize distance for everybody. So if you're hitting one of those older drivers, you're hitting a golf ball that has way less spin than you used to hit when we had those drivers. So typically that combination doesn't work. I hope it works for Jimmy Walker. I think he's fishing for something in my mind. But like you said, I can't see many guys making that transition at all. Yeah, but what uh, – if for those watching golf this weekend, you've been at Colonial. What uh, What's cool about the course? What do you remember about it from your day, from covering it from PGA Tour Radio? And kind of is there something unique about it that we should watch for this weekend? Uh, I remember yelling at Dottie Pepper for getting in my way all day. Um, <laughs> She'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's Don't mess a, with her. Don't mess with Dottie. Uh, well, you know, one of the reasons, uh, the greens are small there. And so fans were surrounding the greens. So there weren't a lot of sight lines, uh, to do our job. So everybody was on top of each other, um, you know, on that golf course. Um, you know, that the horrible horseshoe three, four, five, very difficult holes. You've got to, if you can get through three, four, five and even par, you're playing really well. Um, you know, it is, it's shorter. Uh, you do have to be accurate. You gotta be able to move the ball a, a little bit there, but uh, yeah, finding the greens and regulation. That's why in round one, when Harold Varner the third hit every green and regulation, that was pretty remarkable. I mean, a good day is 14 of 18 uh, in greens and regulation. Harold hit all 18 in regulation. Yeah. So yeah, pretty remarkable. I mean, when, when you're going out and playing golf this weekend, just keep track of how many greens you hit in regulation. I mean, really, like if you're just on the fringe, that's not a green in regulation. Uh, figure out all of them in the regulation. And if you hit 10, you're having a great day uh, as, as an amateur. I could count on one hand the times I've hit all 18 greens in, in round. You know, <laughs> one of them was probably at Grover Cleveland where you're chipping half the greens. So um, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a, remarkable, a remarkable thing to do, especially at the PGA Tour level. No doubt. Absolutely. Well, you guys played this week. Shame on you for not inviting me. Yeah, that's, I, that's my fault. That's, gee, I well, brought it up. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, both our fault, I guess. <laughs> oh, no. uh, but well, let I, me explain what happened, Brian. Well, let me explain what happened real quick, all right? So <laughs> uh, last weekend um, at Lancaster Country Club, they have a thing called the President's Cup. 16 players, scratch from the tips. You've got to qualify. I said, you know, I'm going to challenge myself, see if I could qualify. And... I nearly had trick birdied out to do so. I, I, it's funny, the shortest birdie putt on 16, I had six feet and I missed it. Then I made like a, a 15 footer and an, another 18 footer for birdie on 17, 18 to shoot 79 from the tips to make it. And um, I, was, I was super proud of myself. Well, my handicap, time qualifying, my index was 6.8. Um, Seed six through nine, all shot 79. I was the ninth seed. Uh, my friend Nick, who's a one handicap, also shot 79 to qualify. He was a six seed. The guy I faced, Dean, was a two handicap and <laughs> shot 79. So, um, and I, I got out to a horrible start, and I was, down, I was down five through seven holes. I birdied eight, tough par three, had a great shot in, birdied eight. To get it to four, uh, he made – I thought I had him on nine again. I said, if I can get this a three at the turn, I got a chance here. And he made a ridiculous up and down for par out of the bunker. He, he played – my opponent played fantastic. Uh, I give him all the credit. But I, I – I, like, I was so far back from a distance, so – I don't know. So how does this come to the point that well, you I'm, I'm, play I'm, golf there? Is this <laughs> – I, oh, I, do, we have a, do, we have a, do we have a time frame here on uh, Extra? I can I, no time frame. I like that he put the real quick on there. I'm yeah. following all 79 of your shots here. I'm waiting for the point where you didn't want me to play. So the point being, all right, I'll cut to the chase here. I'm playing around, and I'm like, Jesus, I'm so far. I was like 30 yards behind this guy all the time. I'm like, what the hell's wrong? I'm like, Jeff, I need help. And were you we're playing with the shambo? We, Is that who you were playing with? I said, no, why don't we just play? And you can uh, fix it. And so right away, Jeff, uh, he pointed out some uh, nice things and uh, said, it's your grip. Like, we got to fix your grip and practice it in pole hooks uh, on the range. So not I'm pole hooks, push hooks. What? What? Not a, not a pole hook. You don't want to start a left and hook it. 
All right. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, you want to be hit like a little low draw hook, right? Practicing yeah, yeah. as a. Um, that's the miss now. I just played uh, the other day after working on that. And let me tell you, when I hit it right, and I feel like I'm aiming like oh, way out of bounds, and it turns out like it's, you know, right down the right side of the fairway, and I'll still turn it over and have the left side. But I'm crushing the ball when I get the miss is that there's that low hook. Uh, which can cause some problems, but I'm uh, catching it right more often. And the miss, if I miss, it's not the high balloon to the right. It's just a, a block to the right on that, on that piercing project, uh, trajectory. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So like in Kevin's case, because he had a, he had a, a weaker grip, it probably, you know, that's what's comfortable to him. He started aiming a little bit more right. And then his club would tip over and he'd get what we call steep or over the top. And he'd swing hard to the left as a, with an open blade as a right-handed golfer. So just by correcting his grip, if we do nothing else, he's just, that ball, that club face is gonna be more closed and that ball is gonna start left where it's always been starting and either go straight or hook because his club face is more closed. So there's a corresponding move with that. You have to shallow out your path, which Kevin's also working on. We gave him some things. So the little thing, you know, um, that's why pre-shot routine so important with people and. And the fundamentals, you know, you go to a tour event, those guys are working on fundamentals. They're not working on some crazy, tricky move half the time. And, and just little fundamentals, sometimes they get sloppy on people. And, and you play a lot until you go with what's comfortable. And if you don't check yourself, then things can kind of get out of whack. But, but a little grip change like that, you should be able to compress the ball now instead of hitting a cut spin forehand. He's hitting a top spin forehand. And that's, a, that's much more of a, a powerful shot, as you would know, Brian. Yeah. It's, it's the... The, I, I don't know if I'm expecting the slice grip. I mean, is that the most misconception? Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying it right. You know what I mean? The, the grip you see the most where people are like, I, you need to fix it. And it's always kind of like that grip where it's open and they end up. Yeah. Usually you'll see golfers have their thumbs right on top of the golf club. Yeah. And that puts the left hand underneath the golf club almost. And we call that weak. And then the blade is basically open throughout the golf swing. And you have to find a way to try to get that blade to close. And what most people do is they stop the movement of their body, let that club pass their hands and swing left. Where a person with an overly strong grip where the hands, left hand's way on top, I don't see that very much. That person's got to have a very aggressive clearing move so the blade doesn't flip closed on them. And, uh, but that's, that's a better way to play golf though, actually, than with a weak grip, you'll hit more solid shots. Jeff, I found myself doing this a lot uh, during uh, the last round I played. I'm holding, look at, I'm holding up a sole persimmon. How about that, huh? That that's is cool. a uh, that's cool. A Northwestern number one garage sale special, Bob Murphy Classic. Jeff, you might recognize this. We filmed this on TV. Remember, we hit this in transit. <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I still have my old Tony Pena six screw from when I was in high school. That was uh, that was my favorite driver for sure. Yeah. But anyways, uh, so I would I would I would hold the club up like this, and I, and I would grip, and then I I you know I, so to make sure I got the right grip, I would I. I wouldn't just grab the club by, by the grip, Jeff. I was, I was holding up the shaft. I would take my grip there, and then I would get my right hand on, on there. And the thing you're just doing great sure there, doing. yeah, the thing you're doing right is you're doing it at 45 degrees right in front of your body. That's the best way to take your grip. Don't do it when the club's on the ground. Do it at a 45-degree angle, dead center in front of your body. That way you can see your positioning, and you actually kind of preset your left wrist that way into the proper position. It didn't help my pace of play, though. I can tell you that. Everybody, like, geez, come on. And I'm like, I hit the ball right here until I get comfortable with it. So. Brian, we'll invite you next time. Okay. Maybe you can Maybe you make the cut. Play. All is forgiven. <laughs> That's right. Maybe I should, you, I'll yeah, set you it up. Invite you guys. That's right. That's a good idea. I've already played with Brian. I'm not the one that you know. Brian and I have played. Wow. <laughs> oh, whoa. Oh, no, wait. No, wait. Now, now I should be offended. It's like, That's right. oh, we I play with Brian all the time. Uh, ah. Just three right. days a week. I felt, yeah. felt charitable to go play with Kevin. <laughs> ah. That's right. Well, Jeff's got a lot of community service he has to do, so that's just one of the boxes. Ah, <laughs> yeah. oh, you set me I don't up. Know, I don't know who that's a shot at, me or Jeff. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure. Mate, there, I, I can check a check on both there. That was a good one. That's right. I had a good lawyer. Yeah, I got golf community service. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh, All right. Well, it's a good time to wrap up our extra. Yeah, I think so. For Kevin, <laughs> Jeff, I'm Brian. Before uh, we get in too much trouble with each other. We'll talk to you next time. Don't forget our radio show, Saturday, WGR, 7 to 8. We'll talk to you then.